morning, everyone. So last class, we learned some pretty important things that we're going to use in today's class. We the variables, initial value theorem, and final value theorem. So what I want you to do in this course, in order to succeed, we're going to have to make sure that the previous class you're up to speed with. There's no possibility in this course that you can skip classes because that gap in one class is going to cascade down into further gaps you understand. Every class I teach here follows up from the previous one. And I will do a little bit of recap on prior, but the understanding from the previous class is pretty really important next year. So let's take a look at what we learned last time. We learned about deviation variables, initial value here, and the final value here. We're going to use all three again today to get a single chance to see that. I'm going to show it to you through a new example. We're going to take that example and extend it on and show you how we build up what we call a transfer function. Okay, the transfer function is the central model or the central representation we're going to use in process function. So we're going to work towards a transfer function for this tank system, which we've seen a few times now. And what we're saying is we're going to flow in F0 into a tank. And that tank is height H1, and the flow out of tank 1 is F1, and F1, that flow rate out, is going to have a resistance. There's a resistance here in this valve, and so as a result of that flow out is proportional to the height, but divided through by the resistance. Okay, so that resistance is going to influence how fast this flow out. So we derived before the differential equation for the system based on an overall mass balance. Before we derive H by dt, so H1 by dt is equal to F0 over A, the cross-sectional area, minus H1 divided by RA. Okay, and then the reason why I'm using heights H1 here and flow 1 is that by tomorrow, uh, Friday's class, we're going to put a second tank down here. We're going to height H2 and flow 2. Okay? So whatever I'm going with this example is over the next two days, I'm going to show you how we can build up models of very complex systems. So to do that, I need some notation to keep the difference between height H1 in the first tank and H2. So we don't see the second tank today, but that explains why we've got flow 0 in, H1, and flow 1 out. Okay, so so that's where we're going. Now, what we did last class is we created deviation variables. And we did that by a very simple mechanism. We called this equation A. And then I said, let me write down the second equation B at steady state. We derived that that equation says H, dH by dt is not changing, so it's zero. The flow out then is F zero at steady state. Sorry, not out, flow in, end north. Okay, sorry. So end north, the flow in, and steady state is still flow in, divided by the cross-section area. That's a constant. Minus H1 is changing with time, so let's call it H1S. So the steady state value of H1 divided by R. So that's that same system in steady state. Then we said, well, subtract A from B. Or I should say subtract B from A rather. And so if we subtract equation B from equation A, we introduced this terminology last time, and A is minus H S. So I can legitimately write the H minus H S in there. And the reason is that this differential equation doesn't matter if we just simply subtract the all things. Okay, the differential change of the time is the same whether that function is h or h minus h. So that is a valid left hand side. And then we have cancellation. F naught of a cancels out and we're left with minus h minus hs. Okay, or h one s divided by r a. Now, people who were in Monday's tutorial have the temptation to simplify this a little bit and push this minus sign into the brackets and write H1S minus H. Okay, don't, do, don't, don't try to simplify that way. 
The reason is we're going to create what we call deviation variables. And deviation variables are always defined as something minus the steady state. So we're going to create h dash, or emphasize that that's a function of time. So height one minus hs. So h dash for the first tank's height is equal to h1 as a function of time minus h1s. So deviation variables are always the difference from a steady state. Okay, so that term there is a deviation from steady state. So once we have those deviation variables, we can then rewrite that differential equation in terms of the deviation variable and we obtain then that dh1 dash dt. So I may occasionally omit, omit my subscript ones here. Um, let's just come back and make sure we've got them in. So dh1 minus h1s of the dt. So that now can be written in deviation form dh1 dash. And then the right hand side can be written as here's a deviation variable in the numerator minus h1 dash of ra. So my constants are ra, my time varying variable then is h1 dash. And then now the Laplace transform of this is second hand to us, right? We know that the Laplace transform there on the right hand side, so what we're going to do now is simply take the Laplace transform to get this next line. The Laplace transform of the right hand side is S capital H1 dash of S minus H1 dash T0. So notice what's going on with the capitalization. The moment we go to the Laplace transforms, we tend in our notation to capitalize our variable names. So they weren't already capitalized. So h1 dash becomes h1 capitalized for the function of s. But this is still a function of time. This small lowercase h1 over here is h1 dash at time zero. That's a constant. It's telling us what is h1 dash at time zero. Okay, so it's not a Laplace. It's a back in the time domain lowercase h1. This? Yeah. this isn't a step. This is simply a definition of the deviation curve. I'm going in fact from here to there. Is that equal? Excuse me? Is that like, where's the left hand side? So I'm still busy on the right hand side. Oh, that's yeah. the side. Yeah. And then with the left hand side, maybe that is the same thing. Uh, the left hand side then is minus capital H1 S over RA. So Monday's tutorial group is very comfortable with this. You guys had an example of doing this in the tutorial. But the Friday group hasn't seen this yet, so or had practice with this yet. So I'm going to do this. It's a little bit slower perhaps for the Monday group. Let's take a look and then we said after we've done the Laplace transform, our next step is to simplify that. Well, the simplification is, um, is quite easy. We need to write our right-hand side as h1 dash of s. And let's bring that term over there, s plus 1 over ra. And my right-hand side is h dash 1 at time 0. <coughs> start to get used to this is we know we're going to invert this eventually and we want to have this in the form of <coughs> the lines that are on our table. And so one of the lines that are on our table actually has the term s plus 1. So what we're going to do is let's multiply both sides by ra. And then simplify that out. So RA multiplied on both the left and the right hand side here. We get a bit of simplification. We can write H1 dash of S on the left hand side is equal to H1 dash times 
times zero, my initial condition, times Ra divided through by Ra is plus one. So this tells me then how h1 changes as a function of time if I go through the inverse of flash transform. So if I go from here now, my next step is to do the inverse of flash transform. I can get h1 as a function of time. So I'll give you a minute to do that. So that I can do Um, the, so the reason you uh, multiplied by RA on both sides was because you wanted it to get that form. So you could have done it by just dividing out S plus 4 over RA, but that's not what you wanted to do in this situation. Yeah, okay. um, we're heading towards line 5. Okay, we'll talk about that again. So, two people have asked why this multiplication by RA. We're going to see in, in the next three weeks why we like this form. We're going to see that this transfer function has an interesting form where there's some constants on the numerator divided by tau s plus 1 on the denominator. If you like that form, it's got a good interpretation to it, and so our goal is to try and achieve that by getting this factor tau in the denominator and a plus 1 in the denominator. So that's why I'm heading towards that. You're going to see that this is are uh, going to become second-handedly to do these sorts of multiplications to get that. Okay, so time domain. H1 dash of T. Have a minute to work on it. Any suggestions what that would look like? <laughs> Line six, is it line six? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, okay, so line six will tell you that if you invert that now, you get something of the form, take RA out here yeah, as a constant, as well as H1 dash at time zero. And then what's after that? So there's a 1 over tau, in this case tau is 1 over ra. And then we've got e to the minus t over tau, e to the minus t over ra. Okay. So a bit of simplification then, that these ra's cancel out. And then h1 dash of t is h1 at time 0. So my initial condition for that height in deviation form, please notice that we're still in deviation form here. E to the minus T of RA. Okay, so then write out what you what is H1 dash at time zero? What is that equal to? And what is H1 dash as time tends to infinity, in other words, as you head towards steady state? Do that quickly, those two lines. And for those of you that find that trivial, use the initial value theorem and the final value theorem to solve for the same answers. Okay, so four, four quick, quick answers over here. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be 
been doing lots of examples in class and in the course, so it's a good practice. So at time zero, this exponential term is equal to one, and that's equal to h1 dash at time zero. Whatever that constant was, you simply just recover it. Okay? So okay, I intentionally haven't given that numeric values here, but whatever that numeric value would have been would go in there. Okay, and as the sign just tends to infinity, this exponential tends to zero, so we get zero. I want to know what the actual like value is. We would, in practice, know that initial height. Or like, like so, like I, when I kind of did that, I just wrote like. Yeah, it's a constant. So yeah, but do you want to actually like know what that constant is, or is it, or you just want to know that go with the constant? So think of it this way: we know that h1 dash of t is defined as h1 of t minus hs. So at time zero, so at time zero, we know what h1 and time zero is, and then we can see that it's going to be related there to hs. Okay, so the, in practice, we would know what this is as a numerical value. Okay, we, I'm going to focus a lot more on this in the next example, so we'll come back to this if this is not a very instance where we can just yet. Where I'm heading is this term over here, <laughs> the second one, at time infinity. Does it make sense that that is zero? We don't just want to get answers, we want to interpret them. Does it make sense that that's zero? Yeah. Why? Reach a steady state, but why zero? The difference is zero, okay? So it's telling us at steady state, deviation in deviation form, we're going to get to steady state. The fact that that's zero means we're going to achieve steady state in a long time. Okay, this deviation, h1 dash, will be zero. So if h1 dash is zero here on the left-hand side, it implies h1 equals hs. We want to see this in our systems. We don't want systems that uh, go to other values. We want them to achieve steady state. Okay, so let's quickly use the initial value theorem to do that. The initial value theorem tells us, well, you know what? If I was lazy and didn't want to invert the Laplace transform, I could have done all of this work using <coughs> this equation over here. Okay. So the initial value theorem says if you want to find the, the value of the function at time zero, then write out what the limit is as s tends to infinity of x times h1 dash of s. So multiply this transfer function here by, by s, this transfer function in the green box, multiply by s, let s tend to infinity, what's going to happen? Exactly what we can put over here in the time domain, that you get h1 dash at t equals 0. So this, this agrees. So make sure that you can see that. Multiply this transformation <coughs> by s, send s off to infinity, use Wappertol's rule, and that will convert to the correct value. If we use the final value theorem, which we spoke of last time, we said that that's the limit as s tends to 0 of s times h1 dash of s. What's that in this case? Make 
sets? Do we get what we expect? Yeah. So multiply this the function over here by s, send s off to zero, as that tends to zero, and that will equal zero. So you'll get exactly, exactly what we expect. Okay. So much easier in most cases to work with the initial value theorem and final value theorem than it is to work in the time domain. Yes, why you multiply by zero? I'm sorry, why you multiply by f? That's the final value theorem tells us to do that. <coughs> engaging our brain and think what we're doing. So if we think what this is on the left hand side and if we think what's here on the right hand side, it actually makes sense. What's on the left hand side simply says take a function h of s, that function does that. Okay. So that's my left hand side. This is h is a function of t. And if I take the derivative of this curve, I'll get a certain slope. Now, if I take this function over here that's drawn in a different color in orange. So orange now, I'm drawing h of t minus h of s. So simply takes this function in green and shifts it down by h s units. The slope and rate of change of that green function and the orange function are identical. So we can legitimately say the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. Any shift of a function by a constant has the same differential. Okay, now let's let's step this up a little bit and come back to our tank example and change things around by making a small change and saying, well. What if f0 coming into my tank is not constant, but is actually varying in time? So this f0 up here coming into my tank now is actually f0 as a function of time. This is really where we start to think of systems in terms of inputs versus outputs. Up to now, we've just looked at height, and we've just looked at how height behaves over time. But we haven't had anything to force the function. Okay, so if you think back of that, you might have heard of forcing functions or introducing change. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start to change f0 and see the effect of h1. Okay, we want to understand that if you increase the flow over here or decrease the flow, how is h1 going to react? So, Let's just simply go about it exactly the same way we've done before, except when we calculate my deviation variable, this time I will make sure that n0 doesn't cancel out because in fact it's changing with time. So this is my equation A. Now for this system, what is this at steady state? Take a minute to write out equation B at steady state and then write out equation C, which is the deviation. Go ahead and do that. Equation B at steady state.
Okay, so at steady state, that left hand side is equal to zero, the right hand side, we're going to say is F0 at steady state. Whatever my steady state F0 is, divided by A. And then that height of steady state is H1 subscript S. So my subscript S referring to steady state height is divided by R. So no different to before, except this time we have a time varying problem. And if you calculate the deviation form of that, so equation C then here is the difference between A and B, e, that tells me that the H minus HS, it's here on the left hand side, and on the right hand side we're going to have F naught minus F naught S divided by A minus H1 minus H1S over RA. The fourth step in our recipe, if you recall from last time, is to define deviation variables. Okay, and so we've already seen H1, that's, that's an obvious one. Just emphasize again that this is height in tank one. Sorry for forgetting the H1 sometimes. It'll be important to the Friday's class when we look at H2. So let's define deviation variables here as H1 dash as a function of time is H1 as a function of time minus H1s. And then the second deviation there will be introduced now is in fact F0 dash. And that's F0 as a function of time minus F0s. So we'll have two deviation variables now. So the standard procedure, write out a differential equation first, secondly write it out at steady state, thirdly subtract them, Fourthly, define deviation variables. And then fifthly, rewrite that ODE now in terms of the deviation variables. And we'll get something that's quite a lot easier to work with. <coughs> so if we proceed to use those deviation variables now, we can write in capital, oh sorry, in lowercase h1 dash dt on the left hand side is equal to F1, F0 dash over A minus H1 dash over R. Let's just add those there to emphasize their functions of time. Now let me make an important point here that we're going to use from this point onwards in the course about our deviation variables. We're going to assume our deviation variables are zero at time zero. Okay? In other words, we're saying our system is initially at steady state. So we will assume our deviation variables are zero at time zero. i.e. our system is initially at steady state. <coughs> this is going to become a standard assumption to derive transfer functions. So let's just think through what that implication of that assumption is. The implication is that when we look over there at this deviation variable, for both of them it's telling me so this deviation assumption of zero implies that 
H1 dash of T now I'm saying is zero. So I'm saying my deviation variables at time zero are zero. So that implies H1 dash at time zero is equal to zero. And that gives me then that H1 at time zero is H1 is. Also, that F1 at time zero, sorry, F0 at time zero is equal to F0. And this is going to be standard. It simply says that when we start to consider our system and how it behaves in time, that initial moment when we start looking at it, we're considering our system to be initially at steady state. <clears throat> okay, so take, go ahead now and take this function over here that's a deviation form and take the Laplace on the left hand side and the Laplace on the right hand side. <coughs> Taking the Laplace transform of the left and the right hand side, the first one is easy, the left side says S H1 dash of S minus H1 dash at time zero. That's my left hand side. But look what's happened based on this assumption. What is h1 dash at time zero? It's zero based on our assumption. So that term falls away. Okay. So based on our assumption. F naught dash of S minus capital H1, so we go to capitalize letters for the Laplace transform, H1 dash of S over R A. So let's uh, equate the left hand side and the right hand side and simplify that. So I'll give you Give you some time to do that while I go into the board. So simply write out the left equal to the right and simplify. Of the A 
times h1 dash of s over r a. So if we simplify that, we, our, our tendency is to pull the, the h's over to the left hand side. This is my variable, my output of the tank. You'll we'll see why I'm, I'm talking in that way in a minute. So h1 dash is my output of the tank as a result of changing f0. So whatever my output is, I'm going to pull over to the left hand side. So h1 dash of s, s plus ra. And then on the right hand side, we're going to get f0 dash of s over a. tendency is to also get these terms so that we have something to form tau s plus 1. So multiply both the left and the right hand side through by Ra. function tells me what the output behavior is for a given input. Okay. Let's take a look at that. Let's unpack that for a minute. I'll write it down here so that we have it on um, officially. The transfer function tells us the output behavior assuming initial conditions are zero, assuming the initial conditions are zero in deviation form. So a transfer function tells us the output behavior. What do I mean by the output behavior? Well, the output behavior is what my height is going to be. This is the output. <coughs> For a given input, my input is F0. <coughs> Provide my variables on the which they are, we can derive this in deviation. Now, we do always have the 
input on the bottom. Right. So we're going to see why in, uh, in this class. The, and in fact, we, we might still see it now. That the reason is what, what this is doing is it's telling my input output relationship. If we recall back several weeks ago, we looked at the process control system as you've got a process here and we've got various inputs and we have various outputs from the system. If we call our discussion right in the very first week of this course. There's my outputs and inputs for a process. What we did is we call, we take an output, we put a sensor on it, <coughs> okay, take that, that measured value and put it inside a control system. So we just call this a controller. Now, remember there was one other element we had to give the controller. We had to also tell it the set point. So over here, there's one input set point, or in other words, the objective of what this control system is to do. And then we brought that controller's output around, and that's what was commonly implemented in the form of a valve. So if we take a look at that as our overall diagram of the system, notice then that what my process is doing is it's taking some input, which in this case is that flow zero. My input in this case is f normal dash the function of time. And I'm going to get some output response, h1 dash as a function of time. What we can legitimately do is convert both of those to, to Laplace transforms. So f naught dash of s and h1 dash of s. So there's no different looking at it in the time domain versus the Laplace domain. The utility of the Laplace domain is going to be very apparent to us on Friday and next week. Why we use the Laplace domain is because these terms over here and here are going to tell us how that system is going to behave for a given input. So we're going to get a lot of information from the Laplace transform function rather than the time domain function. So our preference is always to work with the Laplace transform form. So let's, um, let's consider then a, a great example just to really understand and settle our knowledge in that we've learned from today's class. Is what if I ask you if my input to my tank is constant? Okay. So we've assumed so far that f naught is a function of time, but what if f naught is actually constant? Then we should recover the equation we derived at the start of this class, right? Okay. So if f naught dash of t is constant, what is f naught dash of s? know what my input is. So if f naught of t is in fact a constant, what is f naught dash of s? Well, that's, that's easy to derive. f naught dash of t is a constant says that f naught dash of t, let's go back to the time domain, remember we said it was f naught t minus f naught s. So if f0 coming into my tank is not changing, it's constant over time, well, that deviation variable is zero. Right? A constant's deviation is zero. Something that's not changing over time means it's at steady state. So if f0 is at steady state, in other words, this term over here is zero, we're saying that f0 dash of t is zero, then what is f naught dash of s? It's also zero. Okay? So f zero of s then is zero. So logical implication 
that if my input is in fact not changing with time, the Laplace transform of that function is zero. There's no time varying behavior to describe because it's constant. Sorry, I forgot the dash of s. So f naught dash of s is here. So if we know that f zero dash as a function, the Laplace transform is zero, we can easily find now h one dash of s. So h one dash of s <coughs> is equal to r divided by R A S plus one multiplied by F zero dash of S. So I'm trying to find my output given this input. What's H one dash of S? It's zero as well. Okay. <coughs> What does it mean for h1 dash of s to be zero? Let's go back to the time domain. So take the inverse Laplace transform of this. Okay, so this term is zero. This h1 dash of s is zero. h1 dash of s is zero. h1 dash of time in you know, the time domain also zero. So this is a trivial Laplace transform pair, that if the function in the time domain is zero, if the Laplace transform is zero, and vice versa. So if h1 dash of t is zero, we'll recall what h1 dash of t is. It says that that <coughs> is equal to h1 of t minus h1 s, steady state. That was how the deviation variable was defined. And so that implication is then that H1 as a function of time is equal to H1 steady state value. So this is, this is exactly what we expect. If our input to our system is not changing, the output's not going to change either. So this is a trivial Laplace transform. It's constant input, our output is constant. And the reason why that is true is because of that critical assumption. We're assuming we're initiating steady state. Okay? So if I initiate steady state and I make no change to the system, the system's not going to change. What we're going to do next time is we're going to say, well, hang on, let's do something a little bit more useful. F0 is going to change. So what I'd like you to think about is, what is if F0 is a step input? or F0 is a ramp input. And what is a ramp input going to look like to a tank? What do you expect if you just simply increase the flow into the tank over time? What's going to happen to the 